Hi there, I'm Savannah Mexto with Manor Law Group, and I'm excited to welcome you to today's presentation with elder law and estate planning attorney, Robert Manor. The ultimate goal of today's webinar is to save you money. You'll get the most up-to-date, comprehensive information for a retirement tax strategy now that can potentially safeguard you from overtaxation later. But first, here's some quick information about your presen presenters. Manor Law Group is a nationally recognized and respected elder law and estate planning firm. All three of our attorneys are accredited by the Veterans Administration to assist veterans with claims and appeals. Attorney Bob Manor is nationally board certified as an elder law attorney by the National Elder Law Foundation. He's honored in 2020 as both a super lawyer and leading lawyer by both of those peer review lawyer rating organizations. Bob is currently on the executive board of the State Bar of Michigan Elder Law and Disability Rights Section and past president of the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys Michigan Chapter. Lastly, Manor Law Group has been honored by readers of our local paper as the best or favorite law firm for the last eight years in a row. Now, before we get started today, I wanted to share a quick disclaimer. Even though Bob is an attorney, today's webinar will not give specific legal advice. If you have a question about your unique situation, please contact us or your attorney after the webinar. If you do have a general question during today's presentation, please use the Q&A box. We will save time to review questions during the webinar. If we don't get to your question, we will contact you after the presentation. Lastly, note that today's presentation will be recorded and the replay will be sent out to you tomorrow so that you can share that with family, friends, or anyone who you think could benefit from hearing this information. Now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome attorney Bob Manor. Thanks, Savannah. And we're going to get right started into this. So <clears throat> the first thing, I want to make sure we're all on the same page as far as exactly what is a retirement asset. So uh, I, the, the topic today is about retirement assets, and that's a, a particularly important thing, or our assets in retirement. And a lot of us are going to have a specific type of asset that maybe our parents or grandparents didn't have, or at least if they did, it wasn't their primary asset. So in the old days, so to speak, uh, folks would get a pension and they would work for GM or they'd work for uh, some company that uh, would provide them and they'd say, okay, if you work for us for 40 years, you're gonna get a set dollar amount every month and you're gonna get a check every month. Well, <clears throat> most of those have gone away. For, for folks under a certain age, most of those have gone away. In place, we have a different type of retirement asset. And uh, so they're often things like 401ks or 403bs, 457 plans, individual IRAs, Roth accounts, okay? Now, it's important to know how those accounts are substantially different and how they're going to be taxed and how you should handle those as you retire, as you get older. And particularly, and most importantly, right now, is what happens with those assets once you pass away. So a lot of us would like to leave a legacy, right? We would like to leave something for our spouse. If we die first, we'd like to leave something for our spouse. If we, <clears throat> when we both pass away, we'd like to leave something for our family. And I don't think I'm stretching it to say that most of us would prefer that our family get it over Uncle Sam, the government, right? Well, um, the, the truth of the matter is, it's really important when it's a retirement asset that we're very strategic about that. Because if we're not, then Uncle Sam is going to get more of it. It's, uh, you know, statistically speaking, that we know that time and time again, year after year after year, Uncle Sam gets a larger portion than they otherwise should have or could have had been had the uh, had the family done a little bit more strategic planning in setting this up. <clears throat> Most people don't think about retirement assets when it comes to wills and trusts and estate planning, but it is an important element of that. In fact, a lot of estate planning attorneys even ignore this, right? So a lot of estate planning attorneys will tell you, okay, you're, we're going to do a will or we're going to do a trust for you, but we're going to exclude your retirement assets. Well, the problem with that is there's many problems with that. Number one is then we're not being strategic about the planning for the taxes on that at all, number one. Number two is <clears throat> that that ends up being, for most of us, the largest part of our estate, either that or our house. But for many of us, our retirement accounts are going to be the, the most substantial or most of our investment account. Uh, this has been the trend over the years. So people moved away from getting a defined pension where they get a set dollar amount every month. In fact, even those that did get a set dollar amount every month and got a pension every month, 
a lot of those folks took a buyout. So GM, Ford, all the others, uh, several years ago, they came to a lot of the retirees and said, you can keep getting this monthly pension if you want, or we can give you a lump sum and that lump sum you can do what you want with and pass it on and pass it on to your spouse. And it doesn't matter when you die, you know, that you get this lump sum. Well, the issue with that lump sum is that's one of those retirement accounts and it's significantly different in how it's treated and what strategies we have to making sure that it's invested properly, but most importantly, that Uncle Sam doesn't take too much of it, all right? So let's get into it. The first thing I wanna do is really <clears throat> make sure that we're all on the same page as far as what is a retirement asset. So I had an opportunity to speak uh, at the Institute for Continuing Legal Education. So I do a lot of education in uh, a lot of sectors, actually. Uh, I teach other attorneys frequently uh, through the um, all of the law schools when Michigan came together and formed this Institute for Continuing Legal Education to provide education to existing attorneys, right, to, to continue their education. And so I am frequently uh, pro providing them some materials or content or, or presentations. And a couple of years ago, I had a, uh, an opportunity to do a presentation on retirement assets. And so I want to make sure that the audience all had, were on the same page as far as what are we talking about when I say a retirement asset? So I put up some uh, some more technical definitions for you here. Remember, this is from a couple of years ago. So uh, a little bit of the definition has changed under the current SECURE Act, which we're going to get at in a second. But the the point of this was you don't need to de to to memorize this uh, definition, right? This is a technical definition, not required. Let's let's spoil it down. What am I talking about? What is a retirement asset? Well, there's two types. There's Roths. So if you have a Roth, you probably know it. Now, a Roth, the cool thing about a Roth is you put the money in after you paid the taxes. So it's, it's for after-tax money, and then you never pay taxes on it again until it comes out of the Roth. Any growth that occurs in that Roth is tax-free. So it could grow for how many every years, and you're never going to be paying taxes on that growth. That's fantastic, right? Well, the other type, the more traditional type, is the type where when you put the money in, you either got a tax deduction or they didn't take taxes out of it. So a lot of times it's through our employer. So we have a 401k or a 457, 403b, you know, whatever it is to our employer, even things like health savings accounts are considered retirement assets. So anything where you go, when you put the money in, they didn't take out income taxes first. All right. They didn't take out income taxes. And uh, when you take the money out, then you have to pay the taxes. And there's restrictions on when you can take the money out. This is one of the things they just changed. And this is the one error that is in, it's not really an error, this is just an old definition, that they've now moved it up to 72 rather than 70 and a half. So that's kind of a nice feature that you have a little bit more time before you have to start taking out required minimum distributions. But to summarize, that's the two different types of accounts that we're talking about. And that's what the presentation is about today. It's either a a traditional type of an account, IRA, 401k, any of those types of things where you did not pay the taxes when you put it in or you got a tax deduction when you put it in or the type of account where you don't have to pay taxes on the growth referred to as a Roth. All right. That's it. And so, you know, you have just to you probably are very familiar. Most of the people on the call uh, probably are very familiar whether they have a retirement account or not. But for those that have any question, if you're old enough, and a lot of you might not be old enough, but if you're old enough and you had to take required minimum distributions, meaning as of last year, if you were over 70 and a half, as of this year, you're over 72, uh, then uh, that's a retirement asset. Okay. Roths, you don't have to take required minimum distributions. But just wanted to make sure we're all on the same page on that before we get into it. And here's why this is so important. This is why this is so relevant today is this thing called the SECURE Act. <clears throat> now, if you, you probably, if you're on this call, my guess is that you've heard of this and you maybe done a little research and you know a little bit about it and you want to know a little bit more about it. And it is really important because this is something that if you have a retirement assets, and you, you need to update your, uh, your planning. You need to update. If you have a trust, you need to update your trust. If you have a will, you're probably going to need to update your will. 
So there's an opportunity that you can call and have a quick phone call with us and do a quick interview with us to see uh, if your situation is going to be appropriate for that. So at any time, you can schedule a call with us and you get to do it at your own schedule. We, we blocked off a couple of days, but you can pick the time and, and all of that so that we can you can inquire further on this. But let's get into the Secure Act. So you probably heard something about this. This was a law that was bounced around all last year. All of 2019, they kept saying they're going to pass the SECURE Act. They're going to pass the SECURE Act. And it was about these retirement assets. And there was a bunch of provisions of it. But the one that got me paying the most attention was the provision that said, what happens to that account after you die? And how quickly you have to pay the taxes on that account after you die, because it's a substantial change, a significant change from the way that it used to be. All right. And so it's important that we incorporate that change into your planning. So even if you got your trust done last year, probably need to get it updated if you have retirement assets. All right. So um, <clears throat> they bounced this law around all of 2019. It was actually, they kept saying it was going to pass, it's going to pass, it's going to pass. It got through the House, and I think it got 99% approval. So we can't, <laughs> whether you like this law or don't like this law, we can't blame it on either party because both parties supported this, all right? And I think there were some good provisions in this, and there are some good provisions even going forward, but there's some things that uh, are, are um, put limitations on your ability to, to pass this on and and how much you're going to pay in taxes or the kids are going to pay in taxes and things like that. So, um, but it kept not getting pushed forward. Uh, obviously, there's a little bit of gridlock in Washington these days. And so, surprise, surprise, it didn't get pushed forward. But oddly enough, and actually, frankly, not that surprising, in the last month of the year, in December of 2019, they pushed it through, got signed by the president, and then it took effect on January 1st of 2019. Now, remember, this is a major change in how we're going to tax retirement assets, how we're going to tax IRAs and 401ks and all of that. And so they pass it in the last couple of weeks of December of 2019. It takes effect January 1st of 2020. And guess what? They didn't even give us the rules. So the IRS it now has to impose this, but we don't even have any definitions. The IRS has to come back after a law is passed and give us some details, okay? How are they gonna process this? So it took uh, us and, and most attorneys and financial advisors and accountants a little bit to, to dig into this. Um, and in fact, the IRS still has some definitions that they have to clarify and tell us a little bit more about those things. So I'm gonna get into that and explain a little bit more about what we still need to know, but there's a lot that we do know. And now we know that if you've got retirement assets and you've got an estate plan, you've got a will or a trust, you probably need to update it to comply with this law. All right. <clears throat> so we're going to get into a, a lot of the details and a lot of the things that uh, with regard to retirement assets. But the thing that I want to, uh, I think is the most important thing that everybody on this call takes away from this. So uh, we're going to go on for another, you know, 30, 40 minutes here. And if you leave with one thing, I want you to leave with the, this concept here. And I've got the stoplight, right? The red, yellow, and green. So if you've done research on this, if you've done any looking into the SECURE Act, what you probably read is now you're going to have to pay the taxes or the kids are going to have to pay the taxes within 10 years of your death. So you've got this retirement account, you got $400,000, $500,000 in a retirement account. And now uh, we're under the old law. If you had set it up right, strategically set it up right, the kids could actually stretch that out over their lifetime. You could have even passed it on to your grandkids and have them stretch it out over their lifetime. Well, they've made it so that that's much less likely. Okay, it used to be that was just a kind of a thing that you could do. Now, what the what a lot of the reports that I've read and a lot of the articles I've read and a lot of the information out there is, oh no, no, now that's going to be down to ten years. But that's not exactly true. And this is where it's key. And this is where the people that actually pay attention get their documents updated, the lawyers that are incorporating this into their planning, because a lot of lawyers aren't, a lot of lawyers aren't, a lot of lawyers are just going to say, okay, 10 years, we got 10 years, that's fine, we're going to stick with the 10 years. Well, that's fine, but if we could do better than that, why is it important as to how um, how quickly you pay the taxes? Why is it important as to whether or not you pay the taxes over five years or 10 years or longer? And the answer is, of course, the longer you have to pay the taxes, the more money you get to keep. 
because we can stretch those out into different tax uh, years, make sure that we're paying them in lower tax bracket years, number one. And number two is make sure that we're paying them, um, <clears throat> that, that we have longer to pay it so we don't bump you up into a higher tax bracket. And third, then if we can you know, extend that beyond the 10 years. So the key on this, and this is why I have this stoplight. So this is my best way of describing the primary biggest change and the most important change in the SECURE Act is that we now have three different categories and I call them red, yellow, and blue. I'm sorry, yeah, red, yellow, and green, like a stoplight, red, yellow, and green. So ideally in a stoplight, we like green lights, right? We want that green light if possible. And so the planning that I think that we should update your planning for, your will and your trust, is to make it so that it's as if at all possible that we can go into that green column, that we get the green light. What I'm worried about is a lot of people's planning, they're gonna end up in that red light. So a lot of lawyers out there, a lot of financial advisors, they're just gonna assume 10 years and they're gonna be satisfied with that. But you may not even get that 10 years, you might be in the red light section and get five years because your trust has the old rules in it. The trust has the old language of the prior to the SECURE Act. And the possibility exists that you could list your, uh, the trust as the beneficiary of your IRA and end up having to pay the, the taxes over a five-year plan uh, uh, time period instead of a 10-year time period. So let's go through this. We have these three categories, non-designated beneficiary, which means the taxes have to be, after you die, taxes have to be paid within five years. Designated beneficiary, which is everybody where everybody thinks they're going to be as the designated beneficiary, and that's a 10-year rule. And then we have this special category, which is really important that we keep that category open, which is the eligible designated beneficiary. So the difference between a designated beneficiary and an eligible designated beneficiary. Now, guess what? With the eligible designated beneficiary, what I'm calling the green light section, we get to extend that beyond that. So we're sitting here in September of 2020. What category do your beneficiaries, do your kids, your spouse, your uh, heirs, what category are they going to pay the taxes under? What do you think? Uh, some of you are probably answering that question, but you're wrong because <laughs> you can't. You can't answer that question, right? We don't know. We don't know when you're going to die. We don't know who your beneficiaries are. You might think you know who your beneficiaries are, but we don't know who's living when you die. We don't know how old they are. We don't know how much money you have left. We don't know any of this because it might be 10, 15, 20, 30, 50 years from now when you die for all we know. And so we're trying to, what, what we've done in the past and what people will probably continue to try to do is they tr try to guess how much money they're going to have, when they're going to die, who their beneficiaries are going to be, whether those beneficiaries would be the appropriate beneficiaries. And that's all you're trying to predict the future. You're trying to look into a crystal ball and it's you can't do it. It's not going to be very successful or effective. So the idea here is to have your estate plan say, okay, we don't know who our beneficiaries are going to be because we don't know who's living. But secondly, we don't know who our beneficiaries are going to be because by the time we die, hopefully 50 years from now or whenever that is, uh, that person may not want the money. And why would anybody not want the money? I've got an answer for you. Think about this. So let's say you're 50 years old and you got some kids and you've got some kids and you say, OK, uh, I'm going to list my kids as the beneficiary after my spouse. I'm going to list my kids as the beneficiary. Of course, you're 50 years old. They're just getting started. You know that that would be the appropriate thing. Something happens to you want to go to your kids. But you live to 100. So you're 50. You live to 100. And now your kids are 50 years older. Well, guess what? What tax bracket are they in? Well, hopefully, if your kids did well, they're in a higher tax bracket. They're in the prime of their career. Maybe they're in the end of their career. They're probably in their highest paid section of their career in, uh, in 50 years. Or maybe they just retired or, or whatever else. And then the idea is, well, maybe some of them would say, you know what? I'm not sure that um, I should be taking this money and paying it over 10 years at my tax bracket. I'm wondering if it could bypass me and go on to the grandkids and the grandkids could pay it at their tax bracket. And the answer is, well, it depends. <laughs> it depends on if you set up your estate plan properly. Because if you set up your estate plan properly, not only could you say, yes, we're going to set it up so that we have all of these options. 
and the choices are going to be made at the time that we have the relevant information. At the time that we know who's alive when you die, at the time that we know when you died, at the time we know what, how much money you had, how much money you had in IRAs and how much money you had outside of IRAs. At the time when we know whether or not one of your children might say, you know what, I don't really need the money. I'd rather have more money go to the family and have it go to my child rather than have it go to me and pay 40% in taxes, right? Now, what would happen if it did go to your grandchildren and your grandchildren are underage? Well, we wouldn't want to necessarily have it be where your child would pass it on to a grandchild and then have it be where they turn 18. And now what? guess what? They get $200,000 in IRA. They shouldn't take it out because they'd have to pay the taxes on it. But if they do, what do we got now? Well, we got an 18-year-old buying lots of, um, you know, sports cars or fireworks or whatever it is that 18-year-olds buy. And so the idea behind this with proper estate planning is say, okay, we're going to, if you want to leave it to your kids, great. But if we, we're going to give them the option to say, well, if at that time, 30, 40, 50 years from now, two years from now, whenever that happens to be, if they choose to say bypass me as the son, let it go on to my kids and let them pay a smaller tax bracket, but I still want to be in charge of it. So my parents die, they leave me a, uh, an IRA. I say, you know what? I don't want to pay at my tax rate, so I'm going to pass it on to my kids. The kids are going to pay it at that tax bracket, but I still want to be in charge of it. And you can do that through your trust. You can set it up so that the, the uh, your son, your daughter is in charge of the money, but the money actually goes to the grandchild and the grandchild gets to pay at their tax bracket. Now, the best part of all of this is you don't have to make that decision. That's a really difficult decision. You don't know what's going to be going on in your kids' lives at that time. Maybe they're doing fine. Maybe they had some problems. Maybe they're in a nursing home by that time. We don't know. Maybe they got sick. Maybe there's all kinds of things that could have happened. We don't know what the future brings. And the 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 the, the benefit of this, the, the, the beauty of this planning is that you don't have to make those decisions until you die, until we have all of the relevant information. And then we make sure that the heirs, your executors, your trustees get proper advice so that they can make the right decisions. And so if we can end up being in this green column, we'd rather be in this green column. Now you see what's in the green column. Minor children of the descendant, disabled persons, chronically ill. That's a new category. We don't really know what chronically ill means. The IRS hasn't defined that yet. But we could easily imagine that one of our kids could be defined as chronically ill. And now guess what? If they if that happens, do we want to make it so that they end up having to pay it 10 years? A lot of lawyers are just going to set up your trust to say, okay, well, everybody gets 10 years. Everybody gets 10 years. If they don't change it at all, they might end up in the five-year rule. But a lot of lawyers are just going to say, you know, treat everything equally and everybody gets 10 years. Well, that could be a big difference. If you got two, three, four, five hundred thousand dollars in an IRA, difference between 10 years and longer could be huge, especially if it's a Roth. Imagine if it's a Roth and you get to extend those Roth benefits uh, beyond the 10 years. So if somebody's chronically ill and we don't know if somebody's chronically ill until we know who their beneficiaries are, until we know who died. OK. Uh, and so. Uh, the idea here is that that is a possibility that somebody might be qualified as chronically ill. What if it's a, a brother or sister that you have on, on there? Um, you know, not more than 10 years younger than you. Spouses, of course, will be able to continue the spousal rollovers. And then certain trusts. And so the idea is we want to make sure that we keep all these options open. Too many people are going to ignore all of this and just try to fit a round peg into a square hole and they'll end up having their, their kids pay the taxes at five years or 10 years uh, and, um, and, and not take advantage of, of the, the, the green and the stoplight. Um, the second part of this that is important is the advice, okay? You want to make sure that you've set your family up in such a way that they're dealing with really talented advisors. And I know people, especially the people don't like to go see lawyers, but uh, an, you know, somebody that really knows what they're doing and really talented advisors, you're going to give your family this real benefit because let's, let's imagine that they're in this 10 year category. So what's, mo what are most people going to do when they're told that they have to pay the taxes in 10 years? Obviously they're going to end up saying, Oh, we're going to take one tenth every year. Seems pretty obvious. 
Well, guess what? If you take one tenth every year for a lot of folks, that's going to mean you're going to pay more taxes because in some cases you'd be better off paying zero taxes in year one and two and three and then paying the taxes in uh, you know five, six, seven, eight. It depends on the individual. So if you've got three kids, each kid might be best to pay the taxes over different time periods, even if they're all in that 10 year category. For some people, especially with the Roth, it's going to be wait till you're 10. <laughs> Don't do any of it. Don't transfer any of it out of the account until you're 10. Um, if you're in a lower, you know, if, if your kids are in a higher tax bracket at the time, and again, remember, this is, could be 30, 40 years from now. We don't know what tax bracket they're going to be in, but they might be near the end of their career. And so they've got this 10 year time frame now. Now they might be in the highest tax bracket in year one of that uh, 10 year designation. And so most people are going to just take the money out, pay 40% to the government and be done with it. But the really the smart thing to do would be to say, okay, if I'm retiring in three years, we got to look at this and say, well, it'd probably best not to pay any taxes at all in the first three years. Hold that off. Let it continue to accumulate. Let it continue to be tax free. And then we'll be strategic about how we take the taxes later on after I retire, after the kids retire. And so there's all of these things that good advice is going to make a huge difference and this is the difference between families that plan, families that strategize about, you know, making the right decisions and getting more to the family and setting up the family so that they're better off and less goes to Uncle Sam, which is presumably one of our big priorities here. All right. So we will come back to this slide, actually. Uh, the changing rules for uh, for retiring for a generation of baby boomers. So I have mentioned this at the beginning here about how... Um, you know, for uh, the greatest generation, as, as it's often called, um, most of them, they, they got out of school, they got a job, they worked for a company for 40 years, the company said they'd take care of them, they got a pension, whether they did, the company actually did it or not is another question, but this is what they believed was going to be the case. And then for baby boomers, there's some of that, that some people got a nice pension. Even for the baby boomers, a lot of those are going to be where they, uh, they, you know, a few years ago, they were told, hey, We'll give you $400,000 if you take this buyout. And a lot of people chose to take that buyout. Okay. So now we have an IRA versus a pension. So here's the, here's the thing to think about here. As we're accumulating, as we're getting older, as we're working, as we're saving for retirement, the advice that we get all the time is put as much as you can into your 401k, put as much as you can into your IRA, save for retirement. That's great, right? Perfect. Excellent. Great. Good advice. What happens then? <laughs> what happens then? When you retire, what do you do? Well, I'll tell you what most people do. It's at least when they turn 70 or 72 now is they start taking out required minimum distributions. Okay. Well, is that going to be the best answer? Well, a lot of people think they just assume it. Like it's almost a, a um, sacrilege to say that you should pay taxes before you have to. But the reality is there's some really good reasons why if, if you're strategic about when you choose to pay those taxes, you could end up with a much better situation, saving much more money, having a lower overall tax bracket. These are the, you know, we hear about all the, you know, politicians and things like that that pay very little taxes. These are the types of strategies that they use. And, and you can do it too. You can do it too, which is to say, okay, instead of taking out required minimum distributions every year, just because you take out the distribution doesn't mean you need to spend it. <laughs> we can take out the distribution and what would we do with that? Instead of taking out the minimum distribution, take out a larger distribution. And what would we do with that? Well, we can reinvest it. We could potentially, if depending on your circumstances, roll it over into a Roth. Why is Roth better than traditional? Because you never pay taxes on the growth, because you don't have required minimum distributions under a Roth. And so one of the things, well, you're alive. So a minute ago, I was talking about what happens when you die. But this is going to be talking about what happens when you're alive. And the idea is we should all be really thinking about this. So I have so many people come into my office and they're saying, well, we don't really pay any taxes uh, because all I get is, uh, you know, my IRA distribution. And I take minimum distributions and I get my Social Security. I don't get a pension. Now I've got these investments and I pay some taxes on that, but I don't really pay any taxes. Well, guess what? That's great. That means you're in a low tax bracket. 
So maybe we should take advantage of that low tax bracket and take some of that money out every year out of your IRA, pay the taxes on it or convert it over to a Roth so that your kids, when you die, your kids don't pay it at the 40% tax bracket. You might've been in a, if you're retired, you might've been in a 40% tax bracket or 25% tax bracket or whatever when you were working. Well, guess what? Some of your kids might be in that now. So now if you're re retired and you have limited income, you've got assets, but limited income, why not take advantage of that lower tax bracket and take out more out of your IRA every year? Take whatever tax deductions you can, because guess what? If you die, your kids are going to pay at their tax bracket. So if they're in a high tax bracket, your kids are doing better than you. They're going to be so much happier if you chose to take the money out and pay the taxes at your, your rates. And so sometimes people will take money out of their you know, they've got a really nice investment that's making decent money, but they'll take money out of that rather than withdraw it from their IRA because they think, well, I can't withdraw money from their IRA. What's going to happen is they're going to save all that money or as much as they can in the IRA. They're going to die. Their kids are in a higher tax bracket. And Uncle Sam gets a big chunk of that, up to 40 percent of it between the state and federal taxes. OK, we're going to talk in a second about, well, what's going to happen after the election? What's going to happen after all of the uh, bailouts that we've been doing, all of the COVID stuff that we're going to do. Our taxes going up. I don't know. <laughs> Nobody knows. I mean, I can tell you I know, or somebody else can tell you they think, I don't know, but we have to be prepared for that, right? And so if we're in a low tax bracket and they're saying, okay, we're going to soak it to these other folks that are in a higher tax bracket, well, you better want to make sure that we're not putting your account into that tax bracket. So it's really important to be strategic about when we decide to pay those taxes or if we can roll it over and convert it into a Roth. Um, these are really good and important strategies that can make a big difference even. So I like to talk about from, you know, passing it on to the kids and how much we're ultimately giving to Uncle Sam. But there's another part of this, too. And that is, well, what about you? You know, are you going to have enough money to live on? And um, there's a couple of issues with that. A lot of us say, yeah, yeah I think so. But what if something bad happened? You know, God forbid. What if you had a massive stroke? You didn't die. You lived, but now you need 24-hour care. Or you have Alzheimer's. Or you have, you know, Parkinson's. Or something else that's going to cost a whole lot of money. Well, I got bad news for you. Your Blue Cross isn't going to pay for most of that care. Your Medicare is not going to pay for most of that care. When it comes to long-term care... Uh, you know, if you have heart disease, they'll pay for the surgery. If you have a stroke, they'll pay for that hospital visit, Medicare and Blue Cross. But if you need 24-hour care after that, if you need somebody to help you shower, if you need somebody to help you get dressed, Blue Cross and Medicare aren't going to pay for that. All right. So how are we going to pay for that? Well, there's programs out there. It's actually something we, we do in my office where we can help you for that. There's government programs out there that we can help you qualify for that while you still protect your assets, especially if it's a married couple. But guess what? If we socked all our money into IRAs and we weren't strategic about taking that money out and paying the taxes in a strategic way, it's going to be a heck of a lot harder to protect those assets that are in an IRA than the ones that are not or in a 401k. That's why I say, really, once you turn, once you retire, we start, we, we should start thinking about what's the best way to pay those taxes. And I would like to tell you a formula. I'd like to be able to say, OK, here's what we're going to do. A minus C plus B. No, we can't do that, right? The strategy is going to be unique to everybody. So if there's you know 20 people on this call, uh, there's going to be 20 different strategies that we would use to make sure that we're going to do what's best for your specific you know circumstances. And there's just not a formula. I mean, there's not some place on Google you can look it up and say, okay, well, here's the strategy. It's not a formula. It's saying, okay, here's the tax bracket that you're in. Here's the tax bracket that you're likely to be in for the next few years. You know, um, you're retiring soon. You're not retiring soon. You've already retired. There's going to be a strategy as far as making sure we minimize those taxes. And it's not just for the really rich people. It's not for the multimillionaire billionaires. OK, this is for it's more important, honestly, for average folks, because we don't want to be in a situation where because of the tax burden, because of a nursing home stay, because of a long term care need, we end up going broke before we die. That, that, that would be sort of the worst case scenario. So if this is something you think you can, we can help you with, uh, you do have an opportunity to schedule that 15-minute call. There's no obligation. It's just kind of an opportunity to interview us, and we, we interview you. Um, possible tools and strategies available for to retirees to help develop a retirement tax strategy. Well, this is something that really it does require. I couldn't hear what you said. 
Oops. <laughs> this does require uh, uh, a combination. So you're going to have, presumably you have a financial advisor. Now the good news for you, it's a talk to us. I'm not a financial advisor. And I say that's good news is because I don't, I'm not intending to invest your assets for you. I'm not going to tell you to buy this annuity or to buy this mutual fund or to buy this. That's not my job. My job is to work with your financial advisor and help come up with a strategy, maybe even bring in an accountant if necessary or if appropriate. But the idea is, the good news is, you know, to have kind of a, a combination of experts, combination of advisors that can really come up with that strategy. And that's that's really what's important because with the financial advisors, they're going to have different pulls and, and, and pushes. And with the lawyer, I'm going to have different pulls and pushes. And it's the combination of saying, OK, we want to have the best investment strategy. We also want to have the best tax strategy. We also want to have the long, most long term care strategy. And you can do that with one person, but it's, I like the idea of having it be uh, where we have, a, you know, a combination of brains, a combination of advice, because if I were selling, one of the reasons I don't sell financial products is because if I'm selling it, I have an incentive too. If I have an, if I'm, you know, and that, that's fine. Everybody needs to, to make a living. And so, but I haven't, I, if I'm selling something or if I'm, I'm telling you to do it, I have an advantage uh, or I have, I have uh, an incentive. And so the idea behind this is simply that uh, having an independent lawyer and independent financial advisor and having them work together is actually, in my view, the best answer. And it isn't that costly. So what we, we do is we come up with a strategy that's going to typically what, how we charge, just so you know, is by flat fees. So we, we give you a quote. We, we, we tell you it's going to cost this much. Now, we can't always do that depending on your circumstances, but it is a, it's a nice thing so that it's not this un, never ending, ongoing, you're, you know, where you never know how much it's going to cost you. OK, so let's take a look here. Uh, we mentioned this. So, you know, how rising taxes may affect your retirement cash flow. This is really important, obviously. So we have an election coming up. Now, who's going to win? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, who's going to uh, raise taxes? I don't know. Um, are, they all, are they both going to raise taxes? I don't know. What I do know is that we had a over a trillion dollar uh, stimulus package in uh, May, I think it was. And then they're talking about another trillion dollar stimulus package. And uh, there was already a significant budget deficit. And so I know at some point, people are going to start thinking about raising taxes. How is that going to affect how you're going to have enough money to live on, but also being strategic about this planning? And that's why I think it's important. So many people just say, oh, I'm just going to ignore this. I'm just going to do take required minimum distributions. I'll leave it off to somebody else. Well, I mean, okay, that's fine. It just means that the likelihood is you're going to end up, you know, all of that hard work, all of that savings you had, and it's going to end up going not to your family, not to you, but to, you know, taxes. And so, uh, we got to think about that. And that's part of our strategic planning and part of the pl planning with the financial advisor and the lawyer to kind of work together to say, OK, well, do we have a plan in place to talk about taxes and under you know, what circumstances those taxes would be? Uh, you know, what, what would we do as, as taxes increase and things like that? Um, common misconceptions about taxes retirement. I'm going to sound like a broken record here because the common misconception is leave everything in the retirement accounts as long as you can spend that money last. Do not spend that money. Take out minimum distributions. Be mad that you even have to take out those minimum distributions. This year because of COVID, they said you don't have to take out minimum distributions. Well, a lot of my clients are still taking out minimum distributions, not because they need the money, but because strategically it's better. They're going to end up paying less taxes in the long run by taking out a distribution this year. But most people are told, oh, 2020, you don't have to take out a distribution. Great. Now we won't pay, you know, take out that distribution. Well, likelihood is that means you're going to pay more taxes in the long run because you got more in that IRA. So we should, if you're in a lower tax bracket, we should take advantage of 2020, right? If there's other tax deductions that you might be able to take in 2020, take advantage of it. One of the things we deal with a lot is folks that are um, that need care, that they need some kind of home care or assisted living or nursing home care. And one of the things I always tell them is 
You got an IRA? Let's pay for that care out of your IRA. Why? Because that's a tax deduction. The care costs is a tax deduction. It's a medical deduction. You get home care, you get assisted living, you get nursing home. That is a medical deduction. So we might as well take it out of the IRA, take that tax deduction that you might not have next year and you didn't have last year and your kids aren't going to have if you die and leave it to them. So Again, this is just something having the right advisors, having the right people to be able to give you this advice. That's advice that I give over a 10 minute phone call. How expensive is that to have a lawyer that for 10 minutes, I can make sure that you're going to end up having this uh, situation where you got, okay, we're going to be paying for care for the next year. You have a broken hip. We're going to be paying for care. Well, let's think about taking that out of the IRA. You probably hadn't heard that advice before. Okay. And so that's just something that, uh, you know, that's, again, probably the most common misconception is the best thing to do is leave it all in there and just take up minimum distributions. So as you can see, you know, we're all about the solutions and options. I kind of want to go back to this. This is the big thing that we've been talking about. Uh, and we've done this with all our clients. So we have sort of an ongoing relationship with our previous clients. We have an annual meeting that we do for them every year. We keep a, uh, a database and keep in touch with our previous clients. Uh, our annual meeting is a group meeting where we just kind of make sure that they're educated. We tell them about changes in the law. We warn them about uh, future changes in the law. We remind them about how their plan is set up. We um, do a memory jogger to make sure that they know uh, if something's changed that they need to maybe consider coming in. But the idea is um, that we do that for our clients. And so one of the things we did for our clients is we went back and we looked at all of our clients that said, okay, there's this huge change in the law as it relates to retirement accounts. And so we made a concerted effort to reach out to all of our clients on you know multiple times because it's easy to miss um, uh, something in the mail, right? That's easy to miss something in the mail. It's easy to miss one email. Uh, and so we made sure that for our previous clients, that we repeatedly reached out to them to say, hey, it's important that we at least look at this. Now, not everybody needs an update for the SECURE Act, but we need to look at it and see whether you do. It depends on how much money you have in your retirement accounts, how much money you have in IRA, 401k, 403b, anything like that. Qualified annuities is another retirement account. Any qualified funds, any Roth accounts, look at that. Look at who your beneficiaries are. Look at those circumstances and see whether we need these updates. Um, and you know, that's something that a lot of lawyers don't do, right? They, they just say you, you got your trust and you pretty much never hear from them again. You got your will, you never hear from them again. That's not the approach that we take, um, for, our, for our previous clients. Um, so getting back to this, the idea behind this is we want your trustee, your executor to have the option. If it turns out that one of your beneficiaries is chronically ill, to be able to set it up for them so that the, the one that's chronically ill does not have to pay the taxes over a 10 year period. We certainly wanna make sure that your existing documents don't end up with where you're gonna end up with a five year rule, where you're gonna end up having to pay taxes five years faster than other people, okay? But if it turns out that you know somebody's chronically ill or obviously if it went, went to a spouse, we wanna make sure to do that. But if it turns out that we have one of these categories or what we talked about before, Maybe the person that you originally listed as the beneficiary, maybe they're going to say, well, I'm in a high tax bracket. Why don't I pass this on to my kids, have them pay it in a lower tax bracket? And if they're too young or too not appropriate for them to manage it, then the person you originally designated can manage it for the benefit of their children and still pay taxes at the lower tax bracket. So all of these options are should be available. And this is what we've built in to our, our planning for our clients moving forward. And we couldn't do this before. These are not things that we could do before simply because all of the rules were tied to life expectancy. Now they've pretty much gotten rid of a lot of the life expectancy rules. And although I'd prefer if we were able to extend it out beyond the 10 years for everybody, uh, at least now it makes it easier to be strategic about this and plan for it, okay? And, and include that in your, in your legal planning. So this is just an example of some of the decision-making. So the point of this, and I, I showed this to some of my previous clients, and they got a little overwhelmed by this chart to say, okay, boy, this is a lot, right? This is a lot. There's a lot of different colors, a lot of different arrows, things like that. But the point of this is that the good news is this isn't something that you have to make decisions. If we build all of this into your plan, 
then we can take into account all of the relevant information at the time that you die, which is might be 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now, right? And so we can take into all of that time. If it's 50 years from now, uh, it's going to be, it's not going to be me personally. Maybe it'll still be my law firm, but it wouldn't be me personally. But the idea is you get the proper advice to make the right decision as to which arrow that we follow. So let me just give you a quick example because we got a couple of minutes here. Let me give you a quick example. One of the things that almost everybody does is they list the spouse as the primary beneficiary. That makes sense. And so we can list the spouse as the primary beneficiary. However, if we list the trust and the trust has a spousal only retirement trust. So we have, I call it a sort spousal only retirement trust so that we can still take advantage of that spousal rollover. We're not going to get any tax disadvantage by listing the trust as the beneficiary. If we have the proper language with this, we have the sort trust spousal only retirement trust in it. But why would the, that be an advantage? Well, number one is, what if your spouse is getting older and needs some help, needs your daughter to help her manage that, help him manage that, right? What if your spouse is, uh, turns out that your spouse has dementia? What if your spouse is in a nursing home? One of the things we might want to be able to do is bypass the spouse, all right? Bypass the spouse for a variety of reasons. Now, a lot of times we're not going to do that, but we wouldn't know if it was appropriate to do that unless and until you pass away. We don't know what the circumstances are. 10 years from now, 20 years from now. So building in these options to say, of course, it's going to go to the spouse if appropriate, but maybe sometimes it would be best to actually bypass the spouse and have the trust have that option in it. Okay. And then we have these separate shared trusts, you know, that could go on to the, the kids and protect them. One of the things that happened with IRAs and 401ks a few years ago was a case that went all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court. And uh, one something that you may or may not know about IRAs is that you can't garnish an IRA. You can't garnish a 401k. And so if you ran up some debt or had some kind of financial problem, uh, it's pretty well protected. They can't garnish your IRA. Well, the case that went up to the U.S. Supreme Court was the IRA got handed down from mom to kids. OK, so mom now died. It was mom's IRA or dad's IRA. Mom and dad died. They handed on, they call it an inherited IRA. And so a lot of people assumed, well, if an IRA is not garnishable, then neither is an inherited IRA. Well, the U.S. Supreme Court said, nope, you're wrong. <laughs> an inherited IRA is garnishable. So you leave this big account to your daughter thinking, okay, well, she's going to need this in retirement. She's going to, I'm going to help her out. And then it turns out that she has some kind of financial problem or financial difficulty. They can go garnish that. They can take that, Okay. So under the U.S. Supreme Court rule, how did we fix that? Well, we could have it where instead of leaving it directly to your daughter, you would leave it to your daughter in what's called a separate share trust. So your separate share trust, we still have access to it. We're still going to pay the taxes in the same way that we would have paid the taxes uh, had it gone to her directly. But now it's protected from liability. It's protected from lawsuits. It's protected from garnishment. It's protected from divorce. It's protected from all those types of things. It's protected from nursing home even. So it's a real advantage to have a trust. A lot of people think of a trust when they hear the word trust, all they think of is avoid probate, right? That's, that's the only reason why we got a trust, we'll avoid probate. No, there's a bunch of reasons. Now, a lot of lawyers look at it that way too. I'll be honest with you. There's a lot of lawyers, a lot of trusts I look at every day and they just want that one advantage. But there's a bunch of things that we can do with it if we're going to be strategic and do the right thing and make it so that we're going to protect our spouse, we're going to protect our kids, we're going to protect our family, we're going to protect ourselves. We're going to leverage what we have to make sure that we're not going to run out of money before we die. OK, so those are all possibilities within uh, within proper planning. So I'm looking to see if we have any questions here. If you have questions and you've not uh, put them in the question box yet, I would suggest that you go ahead and do that now. You have the ability to uh, write a question in the in the side panel here. And I'm going to give it a couple of minutes here while we, we talk about some other things. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have before we wrap this up. But uh, one of the things while I'm waiting for any, any questions that you might have is to talk about um, why you might want to uh, click on that bar on the side there that uh, gives you the op opportunity to schedule a 15 minute appointment with us. So why do we do the 15 minute appointment? Let me just tell you a little bit about that. So what we figured out was, 
not everybody wants to come in and not everybody needs to come in. Not everybody's an appropriate client for us and not everybody want, you know, would want us as, as their lawyer. So we des we devised this uh, way that you can go ahead and schedule an appointment. It's a 15 minute call with one of our team members here that's going to just kind of walk through and, and, you know, you can interview us and we'll interview you and we'll see if we think it's a good fit. And if we do, then we'll schedule uh, a follow-up meeting. But this is just a way to kind of get to know each other a little bit and see if it's appropriate. Uh, there's a good portion of the time that we take that call and we say, you know what, I'm not sure that we're the right fit for you under your specific circumstances. And maybe we can recommend somebody else or, or uh, you know, point you in the right direction. Or it's possible that you'll talk to us and say, you know, I'm not sure that you're the right fit for, for you. So uh, that it just is a, is a nice kind of no pressure option just to talk to somebody in our office uh, that uh, you'll be able to get a little bit more details and decide whether you want to schedule the next meeting and the, the next follow-up to see if uh, if we can take care of that. So I don't see any questions here yet. Uh, if you have a question, you're more than welcome to reach out to us. Uh, like I say, you can click on that bar to schedule that 15-minute inter interview now. You can call us at any time. I've put the phone numbers up there for both offices. We have offices in Grand Blanc and Rochester Hills. Be happy to talk to you if you want to call us. Sometimes people like to uh, just kind of schedule that online. Uh, makes it a little bit easier, but uh, whether it's about protecting your assets or keeping yeah, things in the family and keeping them out of the courts, minimizing your taxes, or even getting advice uh, on uh, on a care issue, on a, a long-term care issue. But we'd be happy to help if you're interested and uh, feel free to reach out with us with any questions. And uh, thank you for your, your attention and thank you for your time.